Chapter 20. Specs to Purser. I remember the Chili Coat ball players grappling the Rock Island ball players in a 16 inning in game ended by darkness. And the shoulders of the Chili Coat players were a red smoke against the sundown. And the shoulders of the Rock Island players were a yellow smoke against the sundown. And the umpire's voice was hoarse and calling balls and strikes and outs. And the umpire's throat fought in the desk for a song. Carl Sundberg hits and runs. <clears throat> as far back as I can remember, baseball has been the passion of my life. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I think, or when I say that in the last 75 years, hardly a day has gone by when my thoughts haven't turned to baseball at some time or other. Of course, when I was a youngster, never thought I'd actually get to play in the big leagues myself. That was beyond my wildest dreams. I was just a skinny kid with eyeglasses, most of the time the last to be picked when we used to choose up sides. That I eventually he played seven and a half years in the majors is still a source of great wonderment to me. But I'm getting ahead of myself to begin. And at the beginning, I was born in New York City, 1899. We lived on 77th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues where, above the shop where Dad made shoes and boots. Incidentally, Jimmy... Kegney, excuse me, lived a few blocks away on 79th Street. Jimmy and I it went to grade school together and, and have been good friends ever since. We still stay in touch and get together for some time, time to time, from time to time. I guess it was the 1905 World Series that first hooked me on baseball. I, on, I was only six then, so I couldn't really appreciate Christy Matthewson's three shutouts over the Philadelphia Athletics in less than a week. But for months afterward, my two older brothers, Udi and Gus, talked about a little else. Both of them were Red Hot Giants fans. Soon I was also, oh, and within a year or two, I lived, was living and dying with each Giant victory and defeat. I still remember when the Cubs won the 1908 pennant by beating the Giants in a playoff game that was needed for after Fred Markle forgot to touch second base. I cried myself to sleep that night. When I was 10 years old, I started mar making frequent afternoon excursions up to the Polo Grounds at 157th Street and 8th Avenue to see the Giants play. This meant a five-mile walk each from our home on 77th Street. It wasn't so bad. It took me an hour and a half each way. Dad was able to give me a weekly allowance for only one cent. Yes, one cent. So I didn't have enough money for street cars or subways. And of course, I couldn't pay my way into the ballpark either. Fortunately, or fortunately, I was able to see my heroes from a perch on the Coogan's Bluff of a hill situated behind the home plate area of the grandstand. An open space between the roof and the stadium of the stadium made it, oh, it possible for me to see. And for others crowded together on the rocky hill to peek at part of what was happening on the field. The Giants were managed by the greatest manager of his time, John McGraw. And as I grew up, I learned a lot of obser by observing how he handled his teams. Even then, I was interested in strategy, tactics, and what used to be called inside baseball. I admired McGraw, but of course, it was the Giant players who thrilled me. I loved them all, but my special... Old favorite was George Burns, the unassuming left fielder. I kept scrapbooks where I pasted everything written about at my idol, and I probably fretted more than it he did when he was hitless or failed to come and through to ooh in the clutch. Occasionally, I also went up to see the Yankees and then called the Highlanders, who at the time played at the Hilltop Park in 165th Street in Broadway. Although I had no real interest in the Highlanders, I enjoyed watching any ball game. Also, I wanted to see some of the American League stars in action, too, like Ty Cobb, Sam Crawford, Hal Chase, Tris Speaker, Eddie Collins, Joe Wood, and Walter Johnson. Some years later, of course, and the Yankees moved in Columbia Pre is a bit Medical Center was built on the site where Hilltop Park it had been. Ironically, 40 years later, I spent many months in the hospital undergoing five unsuccessful operations to, my, to save my eyesight. 
While lying there, after going blind, I often had vivid recollections of the games and players I had seen perform on that very site. But again, I get, I'm getting ahead of myself. 1912, I was 13 years old. I got a job posting scores in an old-fashioned corner or saloon, on saloon at 85th Street and 1st Avenue. The scores would come in on a Western Union in ticker or tape, and I'd proudly write them on a large blackboard in the back room of the saloon. For this, I got 50 cents a week and the right to eat whatever free lunch was on the counter. Games started at 4 o'clock in the afternoon those days, so even when school was in session, it was easy for me to get there on time. Naturally, uh, this job made me the envy of all the kids in the neighborhood. Dozens of them crowded outside the saloon. And when I was posting the scores, the most agile would perch on a ledge outside a side window through the blackboard could be seen. As I wrote the scores, those on the ledge would shut out them down to the kids below. One of them always chalked the scores on the sidewalk for the benefit of people passing by. During the regular season, the ticker tape provided only the innings-by-innings scores and the pitchers and catchers. World Series time, though, a complete play-by-play came over the ticker, and instead of just writing in the scores on the blackboard, the management had me stand on a platform and read the tape in an, in a loud voice. This was 1912. Remember, the Giants versus the Red Sox, and the saloon was jammed to overflowing in with hundreds inside and out, eagerly following each game's progress. Unfortunately, that was the year Fred Snodgrass, as one of my favorites, dropped a fly ball in the 10th inning of the last game, after which the Red Sox scored two unearned runs to come from behind when win the series. I broke down and found it was almost impossible to announce the tragic events to the hushed crowd. After it was all over, I sat on the platform silently reading and rereading the doleful news on the tape, as though repeated reading would erase the awful words. When I was in the seventh grade, our history teacher decided to organize a school baseball team. I was overjoyed and eagerly showed up for tryouts, only to be turned down because I was too frail and eyeglasses, wore eyeglasses, I had worn glasses practically ever since I'd started school because I was so nearsighted I couldn't see the blackboard without them. In those days, however, nobody played ball with eyeglasses on. I was heartbroken at being rejected, but I persisted and in following the school team around from game to game anyway. One day I got a lucky break. Only eight of our four of our players showed up for a game, and I was the only rooter from our school and. W- who was on in hand to cheer the team on. So our history teacher, manager, put me in center field, probably because it was the least desirable position. The playing field was under the Queensboro Bridge and had a basketball court near the center field area. With two wooden standards, the kids shooting baskets, center field post hazards that all their members of the team wanted no part of. As things turned out, though, I had no accidents, was lucky enough to make a sparkling one-handed catch and also contributed to hits. From then on, I was a regular. As I mentioned before, Dad was a shoe and boot maker and a good one. However, he had a tough time keeping his head above water financially. When I was in school, he invented an arch support of the type now in general use. But with that capital to exploit the invention, he continued to struggle financially until when things appeared to be coming his way at last, he died. That was 1913, just after I graduated from grade school. My brother Rudy, who was 19, took over the art support business. There was no chance for me to go on to high school because I I was needed at the shop, too. In later years, I often regretted not having gone further in school. I was an avid reader and quite studious, especially when it came to subjects that interested me. But maybe it was all for the best, because Rudy was sympathetic with my love for baseball. He devised a system where I worked at the shop for four hours each morning. They would make deliveries for our arch supports to shoe stores and 
Cairo Opidists in the afternoon. Once my deliveries were completed, the rest of the day was mine. Naturally, I'd hurry over there to a local playground to play ball or else when owned up my way up to the polo grounds and watch my beloved giants. My financial status improved in this time because mom paid a dollar a week for working with Rudy in addition. I got another 50 cents a week week for helping a tenant in our building with her English and a quarter every Friday night for being what is called the Shab's Goy. Turning the lights on and off in a nearby Jewish synagogue. Go? I don't know how to say that. It's, it's, it's something Jewish. I know that. Now I was really in the chips, and for the first time in my life, I didn't have to sit up on Coogan's Bluff to watch the New York Giants play. I could actually afford to pay my way to the ballpark. Those days, by the way, bleacher seats at the polo grounds cost only 50 cents. Better yet, for a time, a section of the bleachers were roped off and could be occupied for only a quarter. Later on, the rope was removed, but the first 200 people through the turnstiles were still admitted for a quarter. Needless to say, I generally managed to be one of those 200. As I grew up, I was determined to try my best to be a ball player myself. Practiced every aspect of the game, hour after hour, day after day. I taught myself how to hit left-handed, although I'm a naturally righty. And became a good enough fielder to play second or third base or shortstop on some of the best semi-pro teams in the New York area. 1920, I was playing second base with the top semi-pro team in Orange, New Jersey. Our manager was Billy Swanson, a veteran who had been up with the Boston Red Sox for a while. He helped to polish off a lot of my rough edges because up until then, I'd been mostly self-taught. That was my last year as a sandlotter. Shortly after the season ended, I signed a contract with the Syracuse Stars in the International League and looked forward to playing for the next year as a full-time professional. What actually happened, though, was beyond my wildest dreams in December, just a couple months after I signed with Syracuse, became a farm team of the St. Louis Cardinals. As a result, some of us were invited to go to spring training early in with the Cardinals instead of waiting for the Syracuse training camp to open up a few weeks later. I had a sensational spring, and in April, Branch Rickey, the Cardinals manager at the time, transferred my contract from Syracuse is to the St. Louis Cardinals. So when the 1921 season opened, what do you think was the starting second baseman for the St. Louis Cardinals? Lo and behold, none other than the first... It's be is tackled infielder or in the big league history. Yours truly, I I couldn't read that. Be spectacled. Be I don't know. <laughs> this was quite a dramatic change because the previous year the Cardinals second baseman had been Rogers Hornsby, this league's leading hitter, Mister Ricky, but. Hit me at second base to open the season and switched Hornsby to left field. Didn't work out, though, because Hornsby was no outfielder. He had always been in weak on fly balls, which is annoying when you're a second baseman, but catastrophic when you're an outfielder. So Ricky moved Tori V back to second, and I became an all, all-around infield utility man. A role I played with the Cardinals for most of the 1920s, I don't know if anyone else by the way, who jumped directly from Sandlot Ball to the big leagues without ever playing high school, college, or minor league baseball. Incidentally, can you possibly imagine how I I felt every time we played McGraw's Giants at the Polo Grounds? Never walked through the players' entrance at the Polo Grounds without getting goose pimples. I think black to the... er, I think back to the countless hours I spent peeking at the field from Coogan's Bluff and wonder whether or not I was streaming. Most often, I was a shortstop during my years with the Cardinals. I hit 324 in 1922 and 313 in 1926. I also led the National League in pinch hitting in 1926. The most important hit of my life was a key pinch hit double on the game that clinched the pennant for the Cardinals in 1926. 
But I wasn't a top-notch defensive shortstop. Unfortunately, second base was my natural and best position defensively. I say unfortunately because I had the bad luck to be on the same team as two of the greatest second basemen in the history of baseball, Roger Hornsby and Frankie Fresh. All Hornsby did was lead the league in hitting year after year. He hit for over 400, yes, 400, 1922, 1924, and 1925. I'm competing for the second base job with the man who's generally considered the greatest right-handed hitter of all time. Or one of the greatest cardinal hitters of all time. Hornsby replaced Branch Rickey as field manager in 1925. Rickey stayed as a general manager and took us all the way to the pennant and around in the World Championship in 1926. That was the famous World Series where Grover Cleveland Alexander came in to strike out the Yankees' Tony Lazari in the seventh inth game. A couple months later, we were astonished to learn that our manager had in second baseman Roger Hornsby, the hero of the St. Louis, Missouri, had been traded to the New York Giants for Frankie Fresh. So who am I competing with now? Just Frankie Fresh. The Fordham Flash may be the best all-around second baseman who ever lived. Nowadays, so many ball players wear glasses that no one pays any attention. But it wasn't like that in the old days. Lee Meadows, who came up in 1915, was the first big league pitcher to wear eyeglasses. I was the first infielder. Ball players with glasses were so unusual with them that both of us were automatically called specs. In fact... Eyeglasses or spectacles, as they were often called then, were rare among ball players until after World War II, when shatterproof in plastic lenses started to appear. Since there were wasn't anything as shatterproof glass in my day, I wore regular glasses and never thought twice about it. Just ordinary gold rim eyeglasses hooked securely over my ears so they stayed put. I was never hit in the glasses either at bat or in the field. Well, that's not completely true. Once in infield practice, the ball took a bad bounce and hit me between the eyes on the bridge of the nose. Cut my nose and bent at the bridge of my glasses a little, but the glass didn't break. 1928, after seven and a half years with the Cardinals, Branch Rickey sent me down to Rochester in the International League. Cardinals top farm club. I didn't mind because I'd never liked being a utility man. I wanted to play every day, something I'd never been able to do with the Cardinals. So it turned out, Brent and Ricky did me a favor sending me to Rochester. I had seven great years there, the last three as manager. Got to play second base every day. 1929, I successfully accepted 1,064 chances. Still a record for second baseman in any league. We made 223 double plays that year, also a record. We won the International League pennant four years in a, in a row, 1928 through 1931. And two of those years, 1929 and 1930, I was named the league's most valuable player. After managing Rochester from 1932 to 1934, I got in a financial dispute with Mr. Rickey and left the Cardinals organization. I managed elsewhere in the minors for the rest of the 30s and the early 40s, then became a farm director for the Boston Red Sox in 1943. I was still holding down that job in 1948 when I had my first serious eye trouble. I don't know what it, it caused it, but one day I was working in my office at Fenway Park in Boston. I got dots in front of my eyes and I couldn't see very well. I went across the hall to Eddie Collins, who was general manager of the Red Sox then, and asked him if he knew a good eye doctor. Eddie sent me to a Boston specialist who examined me at great length and finally told me that I had a detached retina in my left eye. Had to have an operation immediately to reattach the retina. Although he thought the chances were only 50-50, the sight in that eye it could be saved. There were two doctors in New York who's, who specialized in such operations, so I contacted one immediately, and the operations was, was scheduled for a couple of days later at Columbia Presbyterian and Medical Center. This doctor was of the opinion that after the operation, you should lie on your back without moving your head for 30 days to make sure the retina wasn't jared 
or jarred loose again, excuse me, jarred. The other doctor had patients on their feet in a week or so, but my doctor was much of a more conservative. The operation took me took place in February 1948, and I laid on my back in the ho- my hospital bed, my eye bandaged, not moving my head. For a month afterwards, I wasn't allowed out of bed for any reason, and to make sure I didn't turn on my side at night, they placed in the equivalent of sandbags eggs alongside me, so I couldn't even turn my head. After 30 days, the doctors has removed the bandages, and we were... D- it was discovered, unfortunately, that the operation had been a failure. I had become totally blind in my left eye. The doctor recommend, recommended that we try it again. So after a couple of days on, is on my feet, I was wheeled back into the operating room and did it all over again. I lay there on my back, sandbagged in, my head stood, oh, my eyes bandaged. Another 30 days, when we finally removed the bandages, nothing happened again. Nothing changed. Second operation was a failure, too. Now I'm blind in one eye. How about the other one? I asked the doctor. Well, he said, I don't think you're likely to have any problems. Don't strain it too much, and things will probably be all right. Went back to work and tried not to worry about it too much. 1951. However, my other eye developed the same problem. I returned to my right eye. I returned to the same doctor in Columbia, a pediatrician, excuse me, this time for an operation on my right eye. After all, he was highly respected an eye surgeon with an outstanding reputation. It was the same routine again. Confined into bed for 30 days after the operation, on my back the whole time, not moving my head, my eye bandaged, waiting for the verdict. This was a lot more frightening than 1948, though, because this time as I lay on my back, I couldn't see anything at all. My left eye was blind, and my right eye was bandaged. For the first time, I started thinking about oh, what life would be like if I could never see again. As I lay there, I often daydreamed about the games I'd seen right in there at very location. Many years ago, when the Yankees or the Highlanders, whatever, as they used to be called, played in their, their old Helltop Park on the exact site. I replayed those games over and over my mind's eye once again uh, and saw Ty Cobb and Walter Johnson, Joe Wood as vividly as the oh, 40 years hadn't in- intervened. Naturally, I wondered whether I'd ever get to see another baseball game again. Well, I was fierce to keep me e- company. 30 days on my back took a lot longer to pass than they'd had in 1948. Seemed more like a year than a month. Well, I was lying there, by the way. I heard Bobby Thompson hit a historic home run off Ralph Branca and heard the Yankees beat the Giants in the World Series a few days later. Anyways, the operation was a failure. Again, we tried two more times, both of which were also failures. All in all, I lay at that same position for three solid months and all to no avail after the third try, which was my fifth operation altogether, counting both eyes. It finally sunk in that I'd never see again. It took a while for me to adjust to that reality, but I never believed in feeling sorry for myself, and I tried to make the the best of it. I became a writer and a public speaker and have pursued those vocations ever since I lost my sight, which is now over 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I've written two books and a lot of magazine articles and spoken hundreds of times, usually before high school audiences. A course I never could have done it without my wife, Mabel. We've been married for more than 60 years now, 60 wonderful years, and for the past three decades, she's been my eyes as well as my companion. Obviously, any success I've had is due largely to her. The theme that I emphasize in a lot of writing that public speaking is that the ball players of today are better than the ball players of yesterday. This shocks a lot of people who expect me to just say the opposite. They're are so used to hearing old timers like me talk about how today's ball players can't hold a candle 
hold the candle to yesterday's that they only half listen. Then when I say the baseball players are, are better than ever, that almost swallow their teeth. Old-timers often get quite upset when they hear that. They say, what does that old geezer know anyway? He hasn't even seen a game in 30 years. Well, in a sense, they're right, of course. It's true. I haven't seen a game since 1951, but I listen to games on the radio all the time. Mostly the Mets or the Yankees or the Red Sox. Many is the day I listen to two games, sometimes three. I read a lot. I was always a big reader all my life, and now... No, I read more than ever. That is Mabel who reads to me. I may have lost my sight, but I still have Mabel in a brain that I can't and think of. Think, can't I? I spent a lot of time thinking about baseball and the good old days and baseball today. I love the good old days. There were great Coogan's Bluff, Hilltop, Matthewson, my idol, George Burns. But let's face reality. Baseball was in, in its infancy then. Today, athletes are bigger, stronger, faster, and smarter than they used to be. Everybody admits it's in football, basketball, and track. What makes baseball so different?